Hey, hey, everybody. Happy Tuesday. And welcome back to the Pathfinder Experience. This is your host, Ryan Duff. Today, joining us on Pathfinder episode 31, we have a guest who probably needs no introduction, but I will do the quick and dirty version anyways. Jim Bridenstine was the 13th administrator of NASA. And while at the agency, he helped spearhead and get the Artemis program off the ground. You might have heard of it and also played a pretty big role in setting the scene for commercial space companies to take over a lot of the activity operations and infrastructure uh, in low Earth orbit and beyond so that NASA could focus on pushing into deep space and more ambitious exploration and scientific missions and the like. Before NASA, Jim was a representative serving the 1st Congressional District of Oklahoma, and he definitely cut his space teeth while in Congress. And I think that will be very evident when you listen to this conversation and and hear a little bit more about the, the Office of Space Knuckleheads that he worked with. After NASA, Jim has gotten pretty involved in, in advising and supporting a wide range of commercial space companies. There is, there's a lot in between the ring between the lines there that I didn't mention, but I'm going to leave it to this conversation. It was a really fun one. And you will hear Jim in just a second here after a quick word from our sponsor. Today's episode is brought to you by Altec Incorporated. Altec is a leading custom injection molding and precision machining manufacturer of key parts and components for rockets and satellites. And yes, that includes small sats. Altec works with customers to develop solutions tailored to their mission needs and goals. Based in the United States, Altec's dedicated team provides design assistance and manufacturing for proprietary and confidential projects. As if Altec's custom injection molding, in-mold electronics, heat treating, painting, and testing wasn't already the whole nine yards, Altec also provides assembly and kitting for a wide range of structural and mechanical products. Learn more at altec-inc.com. That's A-L-T-E-K-inc.com. Jim, welcome to Pathfinder. Merry Christmas. Uh, Are you calling in from Oklahoma today? I am. Yeah, I'm in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and thank you for having me. Merry Christmas to you. Um, and yeah, I'm in. I'm in my office in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It's it's for for those who are who are listening and not watching. You have quite the the backdrop there. I think it's one of the most impressive backdrops we've had. Can you walk us through what a few of those, uh, like what a few of these these. Po- uh, posters, frames, sure. pictures are. And I mean, I think it's actually a great starting point for us to then get into uh, your, yeah. your career and everything that you've done. Yeah. So there's uh there's some good things here. So um, I, I guess on this side of the room, you've got, these are <laughs> like my diplomas from uh, Rice University and Cornell. And then you have uh, uh, some medals and awards that I got from the military and air medal and Navy commendation medal combat B uh, some other things. And then some models there on the desk underneath, underneath those on this side, these are just pictures um, to, to, I guess to I get my right, I guess it looks like my left on your show there, but um, th- this is a, a, a Spartan executive. Uh, it's an all aluminum aircraft. It was built right here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, and it's the first all aluminum aircraft ever built, uh, built by Spartan, um, back in, I think it was the 1930s. Um, so just a little history. A lot of, a lot of folks don't realize that Tulsa, Oklahoma has a very robust aviation and aerospace history. All of the external components for the Saturn rockets were built here in Tulsa. The bay doors for the space shuttle were built here in Tulsa. The strong backs, the big devices that pick the shuttle up and make it vertical for the launch stack were built here in Tulsa. All of the truss structures on the International Space Station were built in, T- in Tulsa. So anyway, this is my hometown. And um, 
I, I like to have a little history on the wall. I used to have a lot more history. Mm-hmm. Now I've got a lot more personal stuff. Um, <laughs> but that's, uh, that's kind of left over from, from that. Um, uh, uh, over my other shoulder, um, there's a picture of the earth rise above the, the lunar surface, which is just, I think, a, an extraordinarily inspirational picture. This was, this was the is this first from the, one the, from a- the 1960s or 70s. Yeah, 1968. This is the first one from Apollo 8, which, of course, uh, was the first time our astronauts ever saw. And that was Christmas Eve, as a matter of fact, 1968, the first time our astronauts saw an Earth rise over over the lunar surface. Of course, they were orbiting the moon on Christmas Eve, 1968. Just above that is a picture of an F-18 Hornet, which I had the opportunity to fly for three years at the Naval Strike and Air Warfare Center, which is the parent command of Top Gun. So my job there was to fly red air. Um, More specifically, what that means is I was a target. My job was to get shot down by Top Gun instructors and others. um, And I got shot down bravely on a daily basis, which was a lot of fun. (laughs) Um, well, well, thank, thank, thank you for that. What, what did it feel like watching? I, I know that Top Gun, the original, partly inspired you uh, to want to go in, and, you know, go into yeah. into uh, the Navy and and become an aviator. Uh, what, 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 what were your feelings watching the most recent one? Uh, Top I Gun love Maverick. It. Yeah, every, yeah it was, everybody. It was great. Every naval aviator talks about how unrealistic it is and, you know, all the things that are wrong with it. But look, it doesn't matter. It's a movie. It's fun. You should enjoy it. Um, and I love it when, when, uh, movies, you know, create American heroes. <laughs> I just, yeah. I think it's, yeah. a, I think it's a, I think it's a great movie. And of course, it will be an inspiration to young people today, just like the original was an inspiration to me when I was, in the summer after my fifth grade year. So, um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm very, I mean, it was just a phenomenal movie, really fun to watch. You just have to not think about, you know, what the, you know, there's a lot of things that are realistic and some things that are not, you just have to be like, look, this is a movie. It's fun. We're going to enjoy it. Does it surprise you that the, the Navy did not let, uh, Tom Cruise fly, uh, jets? Because I know that he tried, and obviously Tom Cruise has this very decorated history of doing all of his own stunts. The most recent of which, you know, you know, made waves on the internet like last week because he rode a, a dirt bike off of a, a cliff uh, and and went into it to a parachute. But I read, and of course you can't believe everything on the internet, but I I think he tried to fly, but I, I know he was in the back seat, so he was like pulling some some serious G's. But yeah, didn't, yeah. I, I guess that's not that big of a surprise that Tom Cruise wasn't. In, 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 I don't know what to... all the details there are or were, um, but certainly um, the the I, it, they do have, in fact, two seat F 18s At least they used to at the at, at in Fallon, Nevada, and maybe maybe they gave him the controls. I'm I'm sure they gave him the controls um, for the you know the back seat of of yeah. either a, a Bravo or a, a Delta F eighteen. Either way, or it, it, I, I guess it could be a, an F for that matter. But it does mm-hmm. these days. It's been a long time since I've been there, so I don't know what right. planes they have right. these days. Um, right. But it, yeah, it's it's. Uh, I don't know. I don't want to comment on that because I don't know any of the details about it. Yeah, yeah. No, that's fair. I think that's a good jumping off point, though. You you know you spoke about seeing seeing uh, Top Gun and. That really inspiring you to to want to you know get get your wings and and, and go fly. So I, I'd love to hear a little bit more about the the journey into into aviation and if that proceeded or happened concurrently with aerospace. And we'll go from there. Aero, I mean, you uh, know, space. Yeah. So um, so I guess I've I've had a long love for aviation. Uh, my dad used to take me to air shows at Carswell Air Force Base in Fort Worth, Texas, um, back in the eighties. Um, and of course, um, I guess after my fifth grade year, not only did the movie Top Gun came out, but my parents put me in a um, in a summer camp where I got to to play with a wind tunnel. This was at the University of Texas at Arlington. Um, oh, yeah. in 19, 1986, I believe. 
Um, and I got to, I got to understand how, you know, the, the aspect ratio of a, of a wing changes the lift and the drag and the camber of the wing and all these different things. And, um, I, I enjoyed it thoroughly. And at, at that point I knew I was going to do something in aviation, didn't know what, um, eventually I went to college. I studied economics and business in college. I had, I had three majors, economics, business, and psychology. Um, and when I was graduating, I was looking at, uh, I was interviewing with investment banking firms and consulting firms. And none of those, none of the jobs that I was applying for or being offered, you know, employment from were, were jobs that I was quite frankly that excited about. Right. Um, and so I, I, I called my dad one night and I just said, Hey, um, I've got some really good offers here, but I don't, I'm not interested in any of this stuff. And my dad said, well, what do you, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to fly airplanes. <laughs> and um, his first comment was, well, I didn't send you to Rice to tell me that. Um, and then, uh, and then he said, he said, you should probably go talk to a, a recruiter. So I did. Yeah. Um, and I, I, uh, I eventually joined the United States Navy and had the opportunity to fly off of aircraft carriers. Went through flight school. The first plane I flew, you can see up above the F-18 there. That's an E-2 yep. Hawkeye. That was the first plane I flew um, after flight school. You go off, through I'm flight so, school, you off, fly a bunch of different. You flew What's those that? off off of th those were those were going off and back on carriers. aircraft carriers. Yeah, so it's wow. a it's I, a know, command I, and control. I, I always, it's it, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it seems like uh, I was okay. So not to not to overly kind of kind of anchor this around a fictional Top Gun movie, but those those were uh, in Maverick. Those were the ones that were that were already in the air once they left the uh, the carrier and yeah. and giving sort of like overhead command information. Yeah. Uh, so the the Hawkeye is always the first one off the aircraft carrier and we're always the last ones to come back to the aircraft carrier. And the mission of course is command and control. So the, you know, there's a, a mission to be had and depending on where you are in the world and what the mission is, um, they, they do the command and control of the airspace and the battleground on the, on the ground um, from an airborne platform. Um, so you might have troops on the ground. They're marching, you know, in a line towards a target. Could be Baghdad or pick, pick whatever yeah. war you might be familiar with. And the Hawkeye is um, communicating with what are called forward air controllers on the ground, TACPs, um, and figuring out what they're up against. Um, and then based on based on what they're up against, uh, the the Hawkeye is doing the command and control of Close air support, you got to find the right weapon system for the right target. Different targets require different types of weapons. You've got to yep. find the right guidance system. Uh, tanks, for example, move. GPS coordinates don't move, so you might need a laser-guided target to destroy a tank. You've got to have the right fuel plan to get that aircraft to the target and back home. Uh, most of the time, if you go down low in a fighter, you're going to be out of gas by the time you come back up. So you either got to get front side tanking or backside tanking if, if you need tanking at all. Um, and so these are all the things that are being coordinated inside an E2 Hawkeye, uh, leading up to and during, uh, during the war. So, um, you really get a big, a big picture perspective, um, from the, from the E2 Hawkeye. And it was yeah. an experience that, um, you know, no, nobody likes to ever engage in war, but, um, to the extent that you are engaged in war, I was um, I was happy to to have that perspective, the big picture, yeah. um, which you get from the Hawkeye, and sometimes you don't get from other platforms. Yeah. Now you mentioned GPS, and because this is a space podcast, I think it's incumbent on me to ask: Was the importance uh, of of space assets when when you were flying in the Navy? Was that something that you were kind of keenly aware of on a day-to-day -day basis or was it just something in the background you know because i i know that like uh I will and well i'm sure we'll get to ukraine later in the conversation but i was thinking about it last week as we were recapping the year and like space has obviously played a huge role in that conflict but i think the first quote-unquote space war was 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 in the gulf and with the the advent, the debut, like the advent of, of precision guided munitions and that sort of thing. Yeah. And that's obviously a while back, but 
Yeah, curious, you know, if you were thinking about that at, at all when you were flying. So I, I will tell you, um, when you're flying these types of missions, um, you, you just know that it works. <laughs> that's mm-hmm. that's what you yeah. know. And you know that it's necessary and it's needed. So whether it's yeah. GPS coordinates inside your aircraft, GPS coordinates for a weapon system, um, or even over the horizon communications using satellite communications, mm-hmm. for example, these are all things that um, were were necessary you know, even back in the days, you know, the early days of the war in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq. Um, and, and yes, um, we certainly aware how important these activities were. Um, I will tell you when I got to Congress and I served on the strategic forces subcommittee, uh, which is a subcommittee of the armed services committee. And, and you're yeah. responsible for making sure that these systems work, whether it's SATCOM or GPS or, you know, space-based infrared systems, et cetera, um, all of a sudden it, you, you have, again, you have a different perspective, which is, you know, in, in the cockpit of my airplane, I just hit the I believe button and it worked. <laughs> um, but yeah, when you're actually yeah. responsible in Congress uh, for delivering that capability, um, again, it's a whole different level of perspective. Yeah, I definitely want to talk about Congress, but before we get to Congress, after uh, the Navy, and, and and we can take this in two directions. Maybe we can go in both directions, but I feel like we have to talk about the the Rocket Racing League, and then I, you know, I also do want to head on head on your time at the the Tulsa Air and Space Museum and what yeah. that experience was like. But let's, yeah, let's start. We we, we have to start with uh, the Rocket Racing League. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so I was in the Navy um, trying to figure out what I'm going to do next. Um, and uh, I read about it in Popular Science Magazine. And it was this idea that we're there were these folks out there. They wanted to race rocket propelled aircraft in a three dimensional track in the sky. Well, when you're a Navy pilot, that sounds pretty appealing. Um, mm-hmm. I want to be a part of that. Um, and then as I continued to look into it and see what they were putting together, um, and I reached out to them, um, you know, kind of what they were doing is imagine, you know, flying a three dimensional track in the sky. That's pr- the track is presented in your helmet visor, for example. So just like in like a, a heads up display. In, yeah. Not even like a helmet mounted virtual display. So oh, wow. yeah. Heads up display is like 1980s, 1990s. Now it's, you know, virtual display in your helmet visor. In an aircraft for the military, it might be for targeting or, um, you know, flight navigation. But in this case, they were taking that same technology and projecting inside the helmet visor a series of rings that the pilots would fly through. So one pilot could be flying through circles, another pilot through squares, another pilot through triangles. And the pilots could maintain safe separation um, while actually not flying in formation. Um, so that's, that's key because normally if you put a bunch of planes in the same piece of sky, you fly in formation, you've got a leader and then a a bunch of other wingmen. Well, in this particular case, there is no leader because you're going to be passing each other in a racetrack in the sky. So you have to figure out a way to create that racetrack so that there's safe separation and there's constant passing without having necessary one, one person leading, one person following. Um, so, so that, that was fascinating. The other thing that was fascinating is, on this vehicle, obviously, you've got an inertial navigation system smoothed with GPS. So you've got real-time data of what your aircraft is doing in space, not, not out in outer space, but in, in you know, yeah. latitude, longitude, mm-hmm. uh, you know, altitude, yaw, pitch, roll, trajectory, velocity. All of this data um, can be captured um, on, your, on your aircraft. And then you can take that data and teleport it off your aircraft into a, 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 a model um, that then creates a digital image of what's happening in the race real time. So once you create a digital image of what's happening in the race real time, now kids online can actually yeah. race against you while you're racing real time in a race. So these kind of technologies in the in the early days of the Rocket Racing League, these were all pretty new technologies and they were trying to right. compile them uh, along with having a rocket powered aircraft, which of course is also <laughs> yeah. unique in don't, itself. Don't forget about that. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it, it wasn't to fly into space. It was to fly within the atmosphere, but the idea was, can we advance rocket technology and avionics technology and do it 
within the, this was the key and this is why I was so attracted to it. Could you do it within the private sector where your revenue streams are from ticket sales, merchandising, television rights, corporate sponsors, um, video yeah, gaming, yeah. et cetera. So this is, so it, this is, this is, this is great. Cause I think we're, we're going to, you know, go through these various, these various experiences of yours and set the scene for your philosophy at the helm of NASA. But I do think that the, I've heard you speak about this before, like the, the, the monetization and, and that sort of not being an afterthought. Uh, I think that, that that's, that's yeah. fascinating. The, the, the problem NASA has had and pretty much every government agency is the starts and stops of programs and the whimsical budgets of politicians. And so in my view, what has been needed for a long time in, in space and, and other endeavors is, is kind of a, a revenue stream that is not dependent on the whimsical budgets of politicians. And, um, right. and I saw that as part of what was attractive to me for the rocket racing league. It was, uh, yeah. I, I enjoyed, I was an investor. Um, it obviously didn't last. Um, and I lost some money and, but at the end of the day, um, I learned a lot, had, had a lot of fun, you know, watching mm -hmm. it as it developed. Um, and I learned kind of, you know, I, I learned a little bit about the challenge of startups. Um, right. And yeah. That, and that was actually my next thought is, as they say in the startup world, timing is everything. Do you think that if that, if the whole, if it was, if, if that existed today, that it might have reached commercial, technical, whatever viability? Because, you um, know, a lot of, a lot of good ideas came before, before their time and for whatever reason. And, and yeah. I'm speaking specifically to startups for whatever reason yeah, it did I, pan out. I don't know the the key is um, the key, the key is, you know, how do you monetize an air show? And mm -hmm. I know a lot of people have tried doing that. It's very difficult. Um, yeah. The um, if you look at like the Red Bull air racing, for example, um, that has had its, its struggles. It's, and it, it has come and gone and come and gone. Um, so, you know, it's, it's hard to know. Um, I, I do think yeah. there is a way, but the, the capital required to make that happen right. would be extraordinarily high. It's, it's a very cool idea though. Yeah. And yeah. So moving on to uh, Tulsa air and space, I think you, you've already started to hit on the rich history and uh, rich aerospace history, uh, in Tulsa. So yeah, I'd love to hear a bit more about that experience. And yeah. how that sort of set the foundation or laid the groundwork for what came next for you. Yeah. So when I left, um, when I left the Navy in 2007, I went to work for a company called Wiley Laboratories in Orlando, Florida. It was a, my job was to work with what's called NOC TSD, Naval Air Warfare Center Training Systems Division to help them acquire training systems for naval aviation mainly simulators, but not just flight simulators, but training systems like the back of a Hawkeye, for example, which is not mm -hmm. simply a flight simulator. It's a, a pretty elaborate um, simulation where you have to have, you know, troops on the ground and planes in the sky and all those kind of things mixed in. So, so I was doing that for about a year and a half. Um, during this time, my, my wife's father had passed away um, and her her mom got multiple sclerosis um, and she was needing more and more help, um, you know, getting to the point mm -hmm. where she needed to be in a wheelchair and she needed people nearby. Mm -hmm. um, and so we had this big burden to move back to my hometown, Tulsa, Oklahoma. And that's my wife's hometown as well. We're both from, mm -hmm. from Tulsa. And, um, and so we, we started looking for positions and, um, I got hired by a nonprofit air and space museum here in Tulsa called the, uh, Tulsa, um, uh, the, uh, it's the, uh, Tulsa air and space museum and planetarium. So I, I worked there for almost two years, um, and then got the, uh, the bug to, to eventually run for Congress. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and we're, we're, we're getting very close to, talk about what, what your experience in, in Congress on Capitol Hill was like, but you, you also at the, in Tulsa at the aerospace museum, didn't you, you were involved in a campaign to bring one of the shuttles, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, that was a lot of fun. A lot of people didn't realize how much, even in Tulsa, people didn't realize how much Tulsa had done to contribute to the space shuttle program. Um, like I said, the bay, bay doors on the shuttles, the strong backs that pick the shuttle up, make it vertical for the launch deck. Uh, you know, the, the International Space Station, of course, which was largely built by space shuttle flights. Um, and when, when we, we think about, um, the, um, oh, there's just, there's just a lot. Uh, the, the, the 747 that carries the space shuttle on its back was modified right here in Tulsa. The, the shuttle carrier yeah. aircraft. Um, those are, those are, those are. The, the Those largest are maintenance, favorite. repair, and overhaul facility in the country is right here in Tulsa. Uh, that's Those are the some American of my favorite Airlines pictures. Thing. What's that? The, the picture, the pictures of the the shuttle riding on the back of. of the, I, I love those pictures. They're yeah, great. they're phenomenal. So that shuttle carrier aircraft, I mean, that's kind of an engineering marvel in itself. And that there were two of them modified right here um, in the city of Tulsa. Um, so that's uh, that was a pretty big deal. And, and, and in fact, the space shuttle came to Tulsa in 1979 on the back of one of those carrier aircraft, really for the purpose of thanking the workforce of the city of Tulsa. So, um, yeah, so the goal was um, they were retiring the shuttles. They, they put out a, an RFI request for information asking for locations. What they asked for was they were looking for facilities that had a 10,000 foot runway that had a museum dedicated to education and that, um, and that had the ability to preserve the space shuttle for posterity. And it just so happened that Tulsa had uniquely the ability to do all three of those things. So, um, so we put together a package and, and we sent it to, to NASA. Um, and ultimately, uh, we, we did not get a shuttle. Um, but in that process, a lot of people in Tulsa got very excited about our history. Um, they learn more about the museum and the people that, that, that worked on these programs for the space, for our space program. And, um, it was, it was a, it was a fun campaign. Um, and I think it was important for, uh, to, to elevate the awareness. Right. Right. And I'm sure it also benefited you too. And just in terms of uh, coalition building, like, you know, you know, building a campaign, building public support for it, that sort of thing. So moving us right along to uh, being elected and uh, serving the in, in the Oak, first congressional district of Oklahoma. Do I, I, I have that right? Right. Yeah, that's right. The first congressional okay. district. You got it. So, so you could you can in looking at your your time in Congress, you can start to see. I mean, the writing, the writings on the wall, right? Like you served in the, as you mentioned already, the Arm, armed services committee and then the, the science space and technology committees. So we'd love to hear about kind of where, what, wh how, how you were thinking about air and space and, and, and your future and while you were in Congress and juggling yeah. that with, you know, there's, there's obviously just in, infinite. Yeah. So you know, going back in time here. Um, you know, I, I was, while I was working at the, at the Tulsa Air and Space Museum, um, I started flying in the Navy reserves and, um, my squadron, we would, my squadron was VAW 77. Um, that's this E2 Hawkeye squadron right up there. Yep. Yep. Um, VAW 77 was a squadron that did counter drug operations down in Central and South America. And okay. we busted about $2 billion worth of cocaine every year on the high seas, $2 billion. And, wow. um, and from my perspective, that was a, that was the, <laughs> the amount of money we spent uh, flying compared to the amount of drugs that we busted. It was a pretty significant, um, it, it was a, 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 a good return on investment. I would say that. Well, it just so happened that my squadron got eliminated under the defense sequester. Which I uh, was at the time I I was not familiar with. <laughs> I didn't know what is this thing called the sequester and how is it affecting my squad and I didn't understand. Right. So I I started I started googling. I know you said like the this you know trying to get a space shuttle in Tulsa maybe elevated my profile and that kind of thing. That was not what I was trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, there certainly are, were probably some advantages to that, but at the time that was not my objective. Uh, 
Right, um, right. Of course. But then my, my squadron got eliminated and I, I didn't understand why. I went back and found out that this sequester on defense was born of something called the super committee. And the super committee came from something called the budget control act of 2011. So I was kind of studying to learn what all this was about. And this budget control act of 2011 basically said, we have to control what's called mandatory spending, which is Medicare, Medicaid, social security at the time. And, and Obamacare was a piece of that eventually, but not at this point. I don't mm-hmm. think I, I can't remember, but, um, Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security were continuing to grow. They're mandatory programs. They don't get reappropriated every year by Congress. If you qualify for the money, you get the money. And the only way those programs ever change is if Congress passes a law to change them, which Congress will never do. So so the, the goal was, how do we force Congress? And of course, I wasn't there in these days. But the goal of the time of, of this Budget Control Act of 2011 was, how do we force Congress to actually change the mandatory side of the ledger. And the answer was, they said they would create a super committee that was 12 members of Congress, six in the House, six in the Senate, six Republicans, six Democrats. And they would have this full authority to change federal spending and raise taxes. And and they could do these things without any debates, without any amendments, without any filibuster. There would be an up or down vote on the floor of the House But there would be no debate, no amendment, no filibuster. And so that's a lot of power for six members of of this, or I should say 12 members of the super committee. Mm -hmm. Um, The the, the challenge was they they put in a trigger where if this this super committee can't come to an agreement on on how to manage mandatory spending, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, then it would trigger... a a sequester on defense, which of course is on the discretionary side of the ledger, which has to be reappropriated every year or else you get what's, what is known as a government shutdown. So, so I'm, I don't, I'm, I'm brand new to all this stuff. I don't, and I'm, I'm learning. Okay. So this super commit budget control act of 2011, terrible idea. Basically you're saying you're going to come to an agreement on this stuff, or we're going to crush defense. And and I read that and I was like, this is this is not how the United States is supposed to work. Right. Um, and of course, the 12 members were half Republicans and half Democrats. Of course, they didn't come to an agreement. Then the sequester mm-hmm. got triggered. My squadron gets eliminated. And then I'm I, I'm trying to learn about this. And then I just wanted to see, did my congressman vote for this? Sure enough, my congressman voted for it. Um, and then I started really considering seriously challenging him based on, yeah. based on that issue. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, I, I started running. I look, I had no money. I had no name ID. I have maybe a little name ID, but certainly not as much as an incumbent Republican yeah, congressman in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, anyway, we, we ran really quite frankly because I ran because I was not happy with the situation, not really believing I would ever win. Um, and at the end of the day, we we got 54% in the primary and went on to win there the general. Go. So um, that's, that's kind of how that whole thing came to be. And of course, it changed the trajectory of my life in ways that I, I, never, yeah. I never could have dreamed. Yeah, yeah. Tell us a little bit right. more. So, when, so obviously when I got there, um, first order of business was how do I get on the armed services committee? That's where I wanted to be. I started mm-hmm. a campaign to do that. Um, I got recruited on the science base and technology committee. So armed services, strategic forces subcommittee, they deal with all of our national security space capabilities. And then um, the science base and technology committee, they deal with NASA and NOAA and National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, about half of their budget is space related. So it's really 40%. But um, at the end of the day, I I was dealing with space a lot in Congress. And um, and I I, quite frankly, I loved it. I I really, I really loved it. Yeah. Tell tell us a little bit more about the American Space Renaissance Act. Yeah. So this was... um, on all the different committees I was serving on all dealing with space related issues, there were a lot of things that kept coming up over and over again. And 
um, we wanted to write a a comprehensive bill um, that 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 signaled that we could make America preeminent in space for generations to come, and that we intended to do that. Um, and we called it the American Space Renaissance Act. We compiled what we thought were the greatest ideas for space reform in the U.S. government, and we put it together. We rolled it out at the Space Symposium. I want to say we did it. 2000, I, I got you. 2016. 2016. Um, and, and it got lots of attention from the space community. Um, and after that, I just started getting all kinds of um, invitations to speak at space related conferences and, and, and other things. And of course, I, I, I took those as opportunities to promote the bill and promote the provisions that I thought were important. Now, to be clear, the American Space Renaissance Act never had any possibility of ever becoming law. It, it, it touched every committee in Congress. We had provisions in there for, um, insurance companies, um, you know, to, to insure not just space launches, but constellations, which means you have to go through the financial services committee in Congress. Yeah. Um, we had provisions in there for if you launch American, you get tax credits, which means you have to go through the Ways and Means Committee in Congress. Of course, you have to, we had all kinds of provisions in there touched every, every committee in Congress. And a lot of those committees don't quite frankly deal with or think about space. So right. it, it never had any chance of passing, but it was a repository of the best space reform ideas that we could, that we, that we could come up with. And then whenever a bill was going to pass, we knew it was going to pass. Maybe it's a, a, trans, a transportation appropriation bill. Well, we wanted to make sure that the Office of Commercial Space Transportation underneath the FAA had, uh, was adequately resourced. So if we knew mm -hmm. a transportation bill was going to pass to fund the Department of Transportation, we would, we would take the provisions that dealt with FAA, Office of Commercial Space Transportation, we'd shove it into that bill. And then it, it would, it would pass. So we got lots of provisions from that bill included in the other bills that were guaranteed to pass. And, um, again, we, we, in my office, we had a bunch of space knuckleheads in there that just loved space. And we, we would just relish trying to get some of these yeah. provisions into different bills. That seems, that seems pretty, uh, pretty politically savvy, right? Because it, as you, as you mentioned, there's no, possible way it was going to pass as a standalone bill, but there were like plug and play provisions that you would, you would tack on to, to certain bills that like, for yeah, example, like the must pass NDAA. That's exactly right. So the NDAA is a must pass defense appropriations, transportation appropriations. Um, and there's lots of other bills that you know are going to pass that are not necessarily must pass and you can, and you can put provisions in there. But the, the only thing you have to know is that, you're going to get a lot of stuff done, but you're not going to have your name on any of it, <laughs> which is right. if you're okay with that, which most members of Congress, quite frankly, are not okay with that. Um, <laughs> but if you know that if you know you're there for a, a season in your life and you're going to go home and it doesn't matter if your name's on it or not, but you're trying to do good things for the country, you can get a lot of stuff done. And um, and it was it was it was a lot. Again, we had a lot of fun doing it. Yeah, yeah, and I mean it's 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 fascinating because I, I know you you created a website for it to promote it. Sadly, that website is no longer live, but you know I was able to do plenty of research on it and 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 see the actual text of the bill. I can put it in in the show notes for anyone who wants to dive super deep. But it, there there are a lot of provisions, you know, just that that are super relevant in in today's civil, commercial, and and, and military space from like. I don't, like like the, the 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 venture class launch and like SSA and it's it's just funny funny to see that so so uh, in, yeah. in many ways in many ways I suppose you and the and and uh, your your team of space knuckleheads were kind of ahead of the eight ball and thinking about yeah. all this a few years ago so yeah so I mean now it's, it, what and, more and of just, a natural just, just so you know ahead. Ryan when I say space knuckleheads I mean that as a term of endearment I consider oh, myself I, oh, totally. Moving. <laughs> to totally. I, I, me too. Me too. I'm, I'm, I, I love that term. I love that term. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm tempted to make that the title of the podcast, but we won't, we won't do that. But, uh, but, but <laughs> it might, it might be, it might, it might be a chapter, but, uh, so, so actually as we, as we transition over into NASA and, and Artemis, obviously topic of the day, I, I actually, the last guest that I recorded with was 
Robert Lightfoot. And I asked him if he had any questions. Oh, well, he says hi, by the way. Uh, but the question well, that he, he, he had that he had to ask, and I think this is the perfect time to ask it is the difference between, you know, being in Congress and authorizing and approving NASA funding and running NASA. Like what, what, what the uh, differences between those two uh, seats at the table, what that's like. Yeah. So it is a, it is a totally different perspective. Um, but I, I would also say, um, they both inform each other very, very well. Um, mm-hmm. so it's interesting. Um, when you're in Congress, you, um, you see yourself as a representative of, of, of people and you're trying to do the will of the American people and you're trying to ultimately, um, put America in its, in its optimum position geopolitically, um, on the globe. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the challenges with being NASA administrator is you're trying to really make the trains run on time, which is a yeah. whole different perspective. <laughs> um, and, and, and I think, um, it's, it's, it's a good perspective, but I will also tell you that the NASA administrator position is extraordinarily political if you're going to get those trains to run on time. And right. when I say it's political, it's not, it's not partisan. It's just political in the sense that everybody's got parochial interests in Congress yeah, and in the Senate. Yeah. Um, and so when you just think about the budget process alone, even within your own administration, you've, you're going to have to work with obviously the office of management and budget. They're going to present mm-hmm. the president's budget request to Congress. But, but even before, you start working with the Office of Management and Budget, you're working with the Office of Science and Technology Policy and the National Security Council and the National Space Council, um, and then the Office of Management and Budget, and then the Vice President's Office. And of course, the Vice President chairs the National Space Council, and then the President's Office. And everybody has a perspective on what NASA needs to be spending money on. And, right. th- and so you have to have these fights within your own administration. When I say fights, I'm talking about how do you allocate scarce resources in a competitive area? Right. Yeah. It's, you know, so the, and so you have to make sure that you're trying to adequately meet everybody's needs within your own administration. And then while you're doing that and the administration is saying, Hey, we're going to go to the moon and we're going to go to the moon by 2024 and we need to increase NASA's budget. And Oh, by the way, if we're going to increase NASA's budget, Mr. NASA administrator, we need you to go get more budget from all of our international partners, our partners on the yeah. International Space Station, and we need you to bring in more partners. Well, these partners, of course, they've seen the starts and stops of other NASA programs, ExoMars, for example, the Constellation program. So now I've got to go sell this, this program while I'm building consensus within our own administration. I've got to go sell it in Japan and in a bunch of countries in Europe um, and, and Canada and, and other places. And eventually, Eventually, you know, you, 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 you get a budget that, that is, you're ready to go. And the OMB presents the budget to Congress. And then you've got to go do the real political hard work, which is convince 435 members of Congress and a hundred senators that they need to vote for it. Um, and so, yeah, it is, it is, um, extraordinarily political, but not partisan. It's parochial. Yeah. And and all along the way, um, you've got to build that bipartisan, apolitical support. So we were doing town halls with Speaker Pelosi out in California, you know, in a time it was very contentious between the administration right. and the speaker with potential impeachment proceedings about to start. Right. Um, and, and yet we have to our goal is to build this apolitical consensus um, and, and call it we called it the Artemis program. and. Um, and make sure that it could it could last not just multiple administrations but multiple generations. Yeah. Um, and I yeah. think we ultimately pulled it off. And it was, um, I say, ultimately, I, I will tell you, there's so much more to do. But but we did have success of it transferring from one administration to the next without yeah. it getting canceled, which has not been the history of NASA. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's a uh, pretty extra extraordinary because a lot of as you you know as you've alluded to. 
a lot of space programs don't survive between administrations. I think one of the biggest, maybe not surprises, but but one one at, like especially notable aspect of of I suppose policy between the prior and current administration is the continuity of of the space policy. And, and that's right. You know, from from Space Force obviously to to Artemis. So I'm sure that that's something that you're you're very very proud of. On on a, on Artemis, I I've also heard. I think you were you were speaking with Morgan Brennan from CNBC recently, and you mentioned maybe it was another conversation, but I think and and tell me if I'm getting this wrong, but the Moon and Mars in the past was that was a partisan and it was like an either or thing. Is that do yeah. I have that right? Why? Yeah, that's <laughs> right. It, that was when I first got to Congress and like. Um, all the Republicans were for were for going to the moon and all the Democrats were for going to Mars. And I just couldn't figure it out. And of course, the history was the Constellation program, which was established by George W. Bush, um, was really about going to the moon. Um, the Obama administration canceled that program um, and said, we're not going to go to the moon. We're going to do some kind of... Um, technology development kind of stuff that was not specific for any destination or, um, or specific mission. Um, that got resoundingly, um, you know, they had bipartisan opposition on the Hill. Um, so eventually they did create a, um, a destination, which was to an asteroid that was going to be redirected around the moon, which that also had opposition on the Hill, bipartisan. And then they said, okay, well, we're going to, we're going to do the mission to Mars, the journey to Mars. And then at that point, Democrats were for going to Mars, Republicans were for going to moon. And it just, um, it just seemed like a, com yeah. how these things get turned into partisan nonsense is ridiculous. Like, they're, right. By the, by the way, you're not going to go to Mars if you don't first go to the moon and you go to the moon with the purpose of getting to Mars. So <laughs> guess what? We don't we don't have to divide on this. Let's unite. Yeah, go to the yeah. moon, figure out how to live and work on another world for long periods of time, and take all that knowledge to Mars. That's that's yeah, what we're doing. They're, they're they're not mutually exclusive, and not you know, all. of course, I I think that ninety nine point nine nine percent of our audience listening to this was will be pretty familiar with the ins and outs of of Artemis. But as you were putting that together and architecting that. The, I think the importance of uh, building kind of a bipartisan, uh, building bipartisan support, and then also you know work, working, including sort of international uh, partners and, and, and allies in that. I and, and so I think that those that that's both both of those are evident uh, and very like very clear. Well, the other you. really, really important plank, I think, and, and I, I'm sure you, you're, you'd be interested to speak to this is, uh, the importance of working and, and sort of outsourcing parts of, parts of it to the commercial sector. Yeah. Is yeah. It so the, again, there's been all the, uh, again, everybody wants to divide. Are you, are you for commercial space or new space right. or are you for traditional space? And again, when I was in the house that these were, Again, people people put themselves onto different sides of the issue, and then they dig in. And the reality is, um, we have to use the best of everything America has to offer to achieve mm -hmm. the objectives that put America in the best position. Right. And in order to do that, we've got to take we've got to take what's available today, which is SLS and Orion, the European Service Module, which the Europeans have invested billions of dollars into. So all of these things are important capabilities to go to the moon and they can be right. used today. And, mm -hmm. and SLS was built from day one to be human rated. Mm -hmm. and, 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 but at the same time, we also see all of these great innovations happening in the private sector like Starship. Um, and, you know, the, there was a, um, a national team to go to the moon. Um, and so we wanted to see how do we bring in those capabilities. Yeah. And so we, yeah. we created a program to go to the moon commercially using SLS, using Orion, using the gateway and have a commercial human landing system. Also, we created the CLIPS program, commercial lunar payload services program to go to the moon mm -hmm. with robots 
commercially. Yeah. So um, all of these things were to say, look, um, it's not either or, it's both. Yeah. And we need to take advantage of what we have built right now today. At the same time, we need amazing innovators that are born from this institution of, of free markets in the United States that is second to none. We need to take those innovators and, and have them create new ways of doing business. And by the way, those innovators can inspire traditional companies to change the way they do business. So it's, it's really, and they, and they are, I mean, they really are. Right. Everybody is trying to figure out how to do, um, instead of cost plus, you know, yeah. contracts, how do we do fixed price contracts and, um, how does everybody fit into that new paradigm? And so I think, I think all of that takes time. I would also say it's critically important as you move that direction that you can't just pull the band aid off. Um, because the, the an, whether we like it or not, there are parochial interests here. And if you want to create division and 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 canceled programs, um, there, there's a way to do that. And that's just pull the Band-Aid off and then have, have appropriators and members of Congress on both sides of the aisle be really upset with the direction NASA is going. So there, there, there's a balancing act here that is very nuanced in order to achieve the end state that we're all seeking, which is a sustainable presence on the moon. Yeah. What's the, how, how would you characterize the difference in terms of commercial or private sector capabilities in the Artemis era versus the Apollo era? Obviously, you know, I, I think this has been pointed out by multiple political leaders, but you know, we didn't go to the moon with just complete, it, it, obviously the, the commercial sector was pretty important and, and, you know, Contractors played played a huge role in building building various com- space hardware components, but of, of course, it, it is a bit of a, a total paradigm shift sixty years later. Yeah. So I'm curious to hear hear your thoughts on on the respective you know, difference in, in capabilities of the um, U S. private sector in, in particular. Yeah. So it's it's interesting. You go back you go back to the 1950s and 1960s when NASA was getting started, and um, you know you had Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo. Gemini, as as the the NASA astronauts call it. Um, you know, it's it's interesting. Um, I come from Oklahoma. Um, we had a senator here named Robert Kerr, who was very close with Lyndon Johnson. Uh, Robert, it's the, these these stories are are pretty amazing. But Robert Kerr took, um, uh, let's see, he he took the the bureau of the the director of the bureau of the budget, who was mm-hmm. James Webb, um, and and he was the the director of the of the bureau of the budget um, during the Truman administration. Brought him to Oklahoma to run an oil company and made him worth millions of dollars. Robert Kerr was not just a senator from Oklahoma. He was an oil man and he owned banks. And he brought James Webb to Oklahoma, put him in charge of an oil company, made him worth millions and millions of dollars. And then later, when President Kennedy was looking for a NASA administrator, Robert Kerr said, hey, take my guy, make him Mm -hmm. the NASA administrator. And then all of a sudden... It just so happened that a whole bunch of contracts started coming to Oklahoma. Um, and those contracts included um, North American aviation and also interesting, um, the people who were responsible for giving those contracts or getting those companies to build things in Oklahoma, they, they also had stock in Robert Kerr's banks in Oklahoma. And of course, when all that work started coming to Oklahoma, those, those people made a lot of money. Back then, none of this was illegal. <laughs> it's just the way it worked. <laughs> yeah. And so people, people were getting all kinds of, of benefits from basically insider kind of operations back in those days. And so born from that, which in, in those days it was legal by in today's standards, you'd be in jail. Um, yeah. but born from that, you get this whole dynamic of law and policy and, regulatory environment to make sure that we're spending we're spending millions of dollars to make sure nobody makes an extra one dollar you know what i mean so right it it it, all of this stuff came about for reasons make no mistake but um 
But that that is and that kind of bureaucratic institutional buildup over the years to t- tamp out corruption, which is, of course, critically necessary, um, also slowed everything down. And, and, and all of a sudden, here comes some space startups that are saying, hey, look, we're going to operate outside that environment. We're going to do it ourselves. We're going to raise private capital and we're going to go do some impressive things. Um, all of a sudden, that started looking a lot better and started working a lot better. Um, and now all of a sudden these same companies are, are selling services to the government. So it's kind of a transformation from a purchased yeah. owned and operated system of the sixties, seventies and eighties to now, uh, uh, you know, we want to buy services as much as possible. Um, and, and I think that's a good transformation and, um, and, and it's, um, it's born out of really the bureaucracy that got established to uh, tamp out the corruption. Yeah, that, that's a, a fascinating backstory. I don't think I was super familiar or aware, frankly, of, of any of that. Oh, by the way, Oklahoma is just, I mean, look at the deals in Texas. <laughs> look, yeah, yeah, Lyndon Johnson. Yeah. I mean, remember the Johnson Space Center was originally going to be up at MIT in Boston. then. John F. Kennedy was assassinated. All of a sudden, we're going to put the Manned Space Flight Center down in Houston. Um, Lyndon Johnson's donors made tons of money by donating that land. And then, and, and my university, Rice University, was actually involved in that because the landowner couldn't donate the, the land directly to the government because that would be illegal. So he donated the land to Rice University, which is a nonprofit, which then donated the land to the government. And that landowner maintained all of the territory around the Johnson Space Center, developed it, made tons of money. And mm-hmm. of course, this was this gentleman was a huge donor to the Lyndon Johnson campaigns, even before <laughs> all of this. And, and Lyndon Johnson made all of this happen. So, yeah, the, it, the, yeah, it's me- it's messy. And, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a Texan, as, as you could see uh, back here. So I, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely OK with you, including the Texas part of the history, because you started with the, the Oklahoma. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, do, do either you, uh, do either you have... way, the, the way deals got done back then w- would put people in jail today. So what did it, uh, what did it feel like to see Artemis One splash down? Amazing. Um, look, uh, that, that, was, um, that was a skip re-entry, which, of course, had a lot of people nervous, including myself. Um, the, the idea that y- you, would rent, you would enter Earth's atmosphere and then... Uh, in the middle of that re-entry, uh, spin, spin the spacecraft at 180 degrees, have it exit the atmosphere again, and then, and then re-enter. Um, obviously that it worked. It worked yeah. amazingly well. Um, but it had never been done before. It, um, obviously it had been modeled in computer simulations, but never been done for real. And it, uh, it worked. Um, and, and uh, you know, the, the good thing is, you know, there were no humans on board, which made everybody a lot more comfortable, including myself. Um, but at the same time, you'd hate to see a program with that much time and that much effort have a setback. And instead of having a setback, I think right. it, it was it, it went as flawlessly as it could have possibly gone, which is amazing right. to see. And compliments to the team at NASA and the, the team at Lockheed Martin with the Orion crew capsule. And of course, Boeing with the SLS and Northrop Grumman with the solid rocket boosters. I mean, these, um, these are people that put in, you know, a decade plus of their life's work in, into these programs. And um, it, we're just grateful. It was, uh, it was yeah. a sight to behold. Yeah. Teamwork makes the dream work, right? There you go. <laughs> We could talk about Artemis for two more hours, but I want to be mindful of your time. And as I mentioned, I think everyone's going to be very familiar, f- familiar with artists and uh, Artemis, excuse me. And I do want to talk a little bit more about commercial space. So you, after, after your, uh, you know, after, uh, stepping down as, as, as admin or not stepping down, but when, when you're, when your term as administ I'm not even sure what the correct language is, but. Obviously, yeah, but yeah, the term the ended. End. Yeah, the term ended. You are, I'm sure, you know, so many companies came knocking. And tell me if this list is, if I'm missing anything, but you are the advisory board chairman of Voyager. You're on the board uh, of the directors at Viasat, publicly traded. 
Uh, you're on the advisory board of Firefly and you're on the board of directors at phase four. And then I, a, something at board or something at, at Acorn. Am I missing anything? I'm an advisor for Acorn. Um, advisor. Yeah, so, uh, so I, I do, um, I, I do advise for other companies as well. Um, the, the way, the way I like, look, here's the thing. Um, I now get to work on projects that I like and believe in. And some of those projects are, um, are extraordinarily kind of innovative. And some of those projects are, have been underway for a long period of time. Um, I, I'm on the, I'm on the board of directors of, of, of actually three companies. One is, uh, Viasat, one is the Aerospace Corporation, um, and, and one is phase four, which is a startup. So those are the three companies that I'm on the board of. Everything else I'm an advisor for. And I, I'll tell you, I like being an advisor because I mean, I, I have the ability to give people my thoughts and opinions on things and, and delve in, um, but not, not have the fiduciary responsibility. There are areas where I do, in fact, have fiduciary responsibility, and 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 that's that's good. Um, but man, I, I really relish those opportunities um, to 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 have um, to be able to give my unvarnished opinion based on my experience. Uh, but but you're right. So Viasat, I'm on the board of. I I believe geo, a lot of people and I, everybody right now is fixated on low Earth orbit low latency, high throughput communications. I'm a big believer that geo is still a critical, important part of the mix. Um, and if you can deliver, the, the, what you're trying to optimize in communications is what is the cost per megabit per second that you can deliver to the customer. And when you're launching constellations with thousands and thousands of satellites that have to be reconstituted every five years, and most of the life of any one of those satellites is over unpopulated territory, that becomes a very expensive proposition. So Leo has a place for sure, but I'm a believer that Geo, if you're trying to still optimize for business. Off, Geo is is still very, very important. And Viasat, mm -hmm. in my view, has a great solution for delivering um the lowest cost, highest performance megabits per second for, for the right for the right price. Right, right. I mean the the statistics for, for the Viasat three stat, or I mean the advertised yeah. performance levels are pretty pretty remarkable. So that that'll be fascinating to watch well yeah i mean there's only 24 hours in the day and there's only one jim bridenstine so i i i guess i'm 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 curious a little bit curious to hear how because i'm sure you know so many folks come knocking at your door how you what your what your criteria is or how you decide who you're going to to, to work with because you do have i mean you've got you've got a, a great mix i i would say because yeah. like phase four is like propulsion like spacecraft engines, Voyagers, like all of these different things, including space station, Biosat, you know, it, it's, it's, it's yeah. quite a nice eclectic uh, mix of, of, of space assets and technologies and capabilities. Yeah. What, what I try to do is I try to look at an area that I think has a big need. Phase four is in space propulsion, but it's not a Hall effect thruster. Phase four mm -hmm. is a radio frequency electric propulsion system, which means you can be fuel agnostic. Um, in other yeah. words, they're using they're using and not not xenon and krypton. Think about Hall effect thrusters. They're selling they're selling xenon now for like thirty thousand dollars per kilogram. Which and, and oh by the been, way, you're buying that xenon from what's that? It's been affected. You're, you know, it's, that supply chain's been dramatically disrupted by the the war uh, in Ukraine. That's right. You're buying it from. From, from Russia or, or Ukraine or China. Um, either way, the markets there are not stable and you're seeing prices spike. So how do you create an electric propulsion system that is not dependent on a supply chain from competitors and or countries that are at war where the supply chain is, is disrupted? Um, well, we need, right. we need a fuel agnostic propulsion system. Electric propulsion provided by radio frequency electric propulsion is the way to do it. So they're they're using iodine for fuel, which is available from the United States. It's one hundred and fifty dollars per kilogram. Um, they're using water for fuel, if you can imagine that, which is critically yeah, important. Yeah. When you think about the rest of our solar system and getting water from the moon or Mars or other places and using it for fuel. Um, and interestingly, and this is what I love the most, 
because it's fuel agnostic, you can actually use a chemical propellant like hydrazine and use it for electric propulsion, which means you can now do what's called multi-mode. You can have a single system that can do both electric propulsion for very high ISP or chemical propulsion for high thrust. So now you can really do what the Space Force calls maneuver without regret. And you can do it within a single system. You have a single fuel tank, a single fuel source, a, a single fuel feed system. But at the end of the day, you can use either electric or chemical, depending on what you're trying to achieve, whether you're looking for high thrust or high efficiency. So I, I think it's transformational. But I got involved in that. That's not that's not a lucrative opportunity. That's an opportunity I said, this is what America needs. I want I yeah, want this yeah, to be yeah. successful. Now it might be lucrative for, for some people, but I'm just I'm just thrilled right. to be a part of that team and it's, I want to see yeah, it. Work. It's more of like it's more of like a passion and, and, and a principle. And yeah. and the other one the other one I'm curious about, and we I, I actually I'll link to to in, in the show notes for folks who want to go deeper on, on phase four and then I mean, I, I always will take an opportunity to, um, to to mention companies that are based in the greater Austin area. So, so Firefly fits that category, and yeah. that was more a more recent one. I think we 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 did we wrote about that as well. Uh, how, how did you? How did uh? What what convinced you? You know, Firefly is obviously not just launch uh, part of yeah. part of the Clips program, and so they, they've got yep. that, and they've also got the the SUV, which is maybe a little bit. Uh, further down down the road, but how, how yeah. did you decide to join Launch? You know, that's I, it seems like a somewhat of a contrarian bet based on yeah. So what? no, the, so you, you're you, I I was very hesitant um, to get mm-hmm. involved in any launch company because there's so many of them, and how do you pick which one's going to win? Right, um, right, and and so I I've had a lot of calls from different ones, but I've always said, look, I'm not I'm not getting involved in a launch company. Well, with with Firefly when they had a successful launch to orbit. Um, I was impressed. Of course, they do have the Clips lander as well. The other, th- the SUV, of course, I-, I think is an important capability. Um, the space utility vehicle or an orbital transfer vehicle. Um, I-, I would say, though, the thing that I'm most excited about them doing is is creating a new first stage for the Antares rocket in conjunction yeah. with Northrop Grumman. I mean that that needs to happen again. When our supply chains are dependent on Russia or Ukraine, it becomes extraordinarily challenging, expensive, and in, in fact, impossible. So here you have Firefly that teams up with Northrop Grumman to come up with a new first stage for the Antares rocket and eventually a new medium class launch vehicle that can uh, compete for the national security launch uh, contracts. Um, to me, all of those things combined said look um there's there's going to be a market here um yeah. primarily because Antares we, we need to resupply the international space station we can't be dependent um on on some of these countries that are having severe su- supply chain problems um and and we're going to need a new first stage of Antares so all of these things yeah conspired to say this is this is the one I want to get involved in so I'm I'm yeah. I'm pretty excited about that too Seems perfectly sensible to me. I mean, we could go through every single part of the space ecosystem and even, you know, we haven't even approached too much on, we haven't talked that much about military space. So a lot of this, unfortunately, we'll probably have to save for a part two, but to close us out here, two bigger picture questions, I suppose. What was, what was, uh, the biggest space story of, of 2022? And what will the biggest space story, and this is obviously a prediction, for 2023 be in your mind? Yeah, I think without question, the biggest space story of 2022 has got to be the, the just the astonishing images that are coming from the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, mm-hmm. I, I just, um, it's, it's eye-watering. Um, it is... Uh, we're seeing we're seeing you know 13.7 billion light years um yeah in, as a distance which is amazing in itself so i the the fact that it's working as flawlessly as it's working after all of the challenges and struggles and and quite frankly the hearings that i had to go through on the hill um i'm <laughs> i'm very excited about the james webb space telescope you know i would say artemis um and i think artemis will I'll have give you, its I'll, day. Give you, I'll give you uh, no, I'll give you. I'll give you an out. You're not allowed to answer Artemis. I I would say I would probably say Artemis too, but but yeah, 
Artemis. I should I should have added that caveat at the, at the beginning of the question. Well, the, I, I honestly think Artemis will have its day, but really, what has Artemis done at this point? Um, th- they have done what we've done, you know, fifty years ago. So wh- mm-hmm. where we need to see Artemis succeed is sustainability on the surface of the moon, and then that will be the most amazing story. Yeah, yeah, and I mean the the it'll be I think next year and and the year afterward will be. Really fascinating to watch this. The some of the you know clips, uh, some some of yes. those those landers and rovers start to start to go to the moon. Obviously, there's there's one there's one. I'm not sure if I, I should know this, but I, the iSpace mission is that is that part of the clips program? Yes. Okay. Yep. So so that's what that there's already one on 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 its way, I guess. And and then there's there's a couple more that should be launching soon. Uh, and then uh, 2023. I know it's hard to make predictions, especially in, in space. Yeah. Like what, what do I think will be the biggest, um, the biggest event in 2023? Um, oh my goodness. I, I would. Um, it's a really hard here's question. What I, here's what I would say for 2023 that needs to happen and needs to be successful. We need to get to a better spot when it comes to space situation awareness and space traffic management. We need to understand how much carrying capacity any orbit can, can, can carry, um, which right now we don't. And we're launching constellations into different orbits that we know are going to be beyond their carrying capacity. We just saw a Soyuz attached to the International Space Station get pelted with something and, and spring a leak. Um, that's going to continue happening, and it's going to put the lives of astronauts in danger. We have got to get smarter about how we, quite frankly, regulate how much stuff we're putting into space. And it's going to require an international effort. It can't be America alone because it doesn't work that way. There has to be an international regime that can, that can help us figure out what is the, the optimum any orbit can carry. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, uh, it's, it's also kind of a, textbook sort of international relations 101 issue is yep. is forging consensus and coordinating on that last substantive question that I'll ask a couple really lightning round quicker ones are you worried about a uh, shakeout in the the you know space markets in 2023 at all given just the somewhat bleak macro conditions Oh, um, I don't think so. I, you know, I hear that a lot. I'll, I'll tell you, we right now we're going through a bit of a downturn because of the yeah. kind of the SPAC craze and some of the yeah. prices that were maybe well that were in fact too high. Um, mm-hmm. And so we're seeing we're seeing some fallout from that. As far as the mac the macro kind of implications, I, d- I don't I don't foresee that being a problem. Um, certainly. When space companies are overvalued and then and then under deliver, that is a problem, and we're seeing that now. But as far as the macro yeah. conditions, I think I think the cost of getting to space is going down. The benefits from space are going up, even mm-hmm. even when there's a setback in the macro economy. Um, those those facts are going to stay the same. Yeah, yeah, I I think I would agree. We 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 would agree. So lightning round. Quick questions. We've already touched on some of my standard fare. Are you a, a fan of sci-fi? Uh, some. Some? What, yeah, what, some. Just, just do, do you have any, any sort of favorite books, TV shows, movies? Uh, so, I, you know, I've, in the I've, sci-fi read, genre? Uh, I've read quite a bit. Of obviously, Andy Weir um, mm-hmm. with Artemis and, and The Martian. Um, the uh you know I, I i i'm guessing that the question is coming do you prefer star wars or star trek um <laughs> yeah yeah, I get, yeah that, there you I get that in a lot of interviews i will tell you what i tell others which is um i'm a i'm a fan of space balls um my favorite character is Bart the Mog. he's half man half dog <laughs> um and he's his own best friend and i'll tell you as the nasa administrator a lot of times i felt like That's i needed a, to be my own my own best friend That's- Yes, that, and that's also a, that's a, that's a savvy answer in terms of not <laughs> not not being divisive and striking a balance. That's that's uh, that's great. I guess the last uh, that I I personally love this show. So maybe this is a bit 
a bit selfish, but uh, do you have any, do you have thoughts on for all mankind? Cause it strikes in a lot of the threads in terms of, of uh, uh, geo, like, like the geopolitical, obviously under, not even undertones, like the, the themes. And it, it, I, I think it's just such a, a fascinating, like alternate history. I'll tell you, I have not seen it. Um, okay. Okay. And well, if, I, I, if you, I feel bad saying that because I've had so many people tell me I need to watch it and I just, yeah. I just haven't, um, I haven't found the resolve to cut out parts of my day to make right. that happen. I need, yeah. I need to do that yeah. though. I need to do yeah, that. Yeah. Well, you're, 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 you're a busy man, but I'm sure at some point, you know, with, with some, with some downtime here and there, you'll be able to yeah. see it. But to, to that end, you know, you're, you're busy. And I just want to say thank you for taking the time. I think this might be our, our longest episode ever. So I'm very grateful. I know our audience will be, but, um, Merry Christmas, Jim. Happy New Year. And thank you for coming on Pathfinder. Well, Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. We'll do it again next time. We need to talk about Mars and life outside our own planet here. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Okay, space knuckleheads. That will do it for Pathfinder 0031. Thanks to Jim for time. We went a little bit over, so I appreciate sharing with me. Thanks to all of you for listening. Thanks to Peter, our new producer, for chopping this up and making it look and sound very pretty. And thanks to Altec for keep helping us keep the lights on. If you like what you heard, leave us a rating and review wherever you're listening to this. It really helps move the needle. And that will do it for this week. I'm Ryan Duffy signing off, and I will see you back here next week.